So welcome everybody. I am really happy to be hosting this session today on a very crucial topic. Um, clearly demonstrated by the fact that well over a thousand people registered to join. Um, and firstly, we apologize for any inconvenience caused by that slight date change. So for anyone who hasn't met me before, my name is Rachel Beck. I'm a former primary school teacher. I'm a mother of four children, ranging between the ages of 12 and 20. And when my first child was born in 2001, I founded Educating Matters. So I have spent over 20 years supporting the well-being of employees with a very specific focus on working parents and carers. But as a business, we work with a very broad range of organisations globally and address lots of other key topics, um, many of them delivered by Gwen, around neurodiversity, LGBTQ+, allyship, mental health and well-being. And today, this is what precipitated this talk, is the culmination of Children's Mental Health Week, which was initiated by the charity Place to Be. And this year's theme is growing together. And over the last two years, we have all experienced challenges and setbacks. And we know, hopefully as adults, that challenges actually help us to grow and build resilience over time. So this is a really crucial mindset to share with our children. And I have spent most of this week teaching working parents and carers the skill of emotion coaching. Sometimes it's called reflective listening. And Gwen has covered children's mental health in general. Now, we know that children are particularly susceptible to mental health challenges. Their brains are undergoing significant development. And 50% of mental health problems in adults have been established by the age of 14 and 75% by the mid 20s. So that's why I want to ask you another question. So I can see 64% of you have five to 11 year olds and around 30% zero to four. And I've got another poll question, just to get a sense um, of how many of you are feeling right now concerned about your child's emotional well-being and mental health. And if anybody feels comfortable, um, I think you could even choose to do this anonymously. If you want to give us a bit more detail in the chat about what is worrying you most about your child, I really want this to be this session to serve as a really safe space to share and normalize common challenges that parents and carers may be facing. So like I said, chat amongst yourselves. I can see you're already doing that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start by directing a few questions to my esteemed panellists, and then you're going to have an opportunity to ask questions at the end. I can see, oh, lots of you already typed questions, which is great, um, or, or shared things. So we will address those a bit later. But can I begin by asking both Esther and Gwen to share with the audience a little bit about your background? and where your interest and experience in mental health stems from. So Esther, would you like to go first? Sure, of course. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, my name's Esther Marshall. Um, my background is in the corporate world, actually, um, where I led on topics of sustainability and diversity and inclusion. Um, and through diversity and inclusion, I used to look at a lot of different people and a lot of different topics. How can we make sure that all of our people at work feel safe, feel included? And a lot of that was around mental health. We found that a lot of different communities found that mental health was one of the big reasons as to why they were or weren't feeling included at work. Um, so I spent a lot of time looking at that in the context of work environment and strategy. So that was from a personal point, a uh, uh, work point of view. From a personal point of view, whilst I was working, my younger sister suffered very badly for around six, seven years um, with multiple different mental illnesses. Uh, we went through multiple different diagnoses of anxiety, depression, um, eventually after six years got a diagnosis of bipolar after long visits in hospital, long stays in hospital for years and years, um, not having the capacity really with the NHS sometimes to give us the support that we needed and sometimes there weren't enough beds so I had to look after her at home and administer some of the medication myself and learn very quickly how to be a carer. Um, 
I had a son three years ago. And while I was taking care of him when he was first born, um, my sister ended up in hospital after a very, very bad um, psychotic episode, going through psychosis. Um, she had to stay with me for five days because there were no beds in the hospital. So looking after a newborn whilst taking her through a, a psychotic episode. Um, and I decided to found something called Sophie Says, which is, um, it started as a book, which is a book that I wanted to read to my son, um, which I wrote during the night while feeding him. Uh, and it's now become a much bigger uh, project because I was going to do the writing and my sister was going to do the illustrations. And I think I'll go into a bit more detail um, on it later with Rachel, but tragically just before the first lockdown happened, um, my mother came home to um, a note from my sister and the police knocked on the door and told us that they'd found my sister's body. Um, and from there, I've basically decided to take a step back from my corporate role and spend every day now working with children uh, to talk to them about their feelings and how to have a positive mental health. Gwen? Well, first, thank you, Esther, so much for sharing that personal experience and also for turning, you know, what, what must have been a very harrowing few years of your life into this amazing resource for families to be able to access. It's so beautifully written. And I just absolutely, so for, I have to start by saying thank you so much. Yeah. Um, but just to introduce, yes, absolutely. It's okay not to be okay. Every parent, and it, it, this is the thing I love about this book though, is that it doesn't matter how old your kids are. It is written as a picture book, but I've, I've read it with my older kids too. You know, it's, it's beautiful. So thank you for oh, that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so my name is Gwendolyn Jones. Um, I started out my career with a bachelor's degree in psychology and then got a um, postgraduate certificate in special educational teaching and worked for nine years teaching children with behavior disorders and emotional disturbances, which are the categories they were placed in, not categories I like to use, but that's the language that we had at the time. And after nine years of teaching, I realized that I wasn't so into the reading and the writing, but I really loved learning about behavior and about relationship. How do people interact with each other, uh, whether it's a relationship with the self, relationship with your parents, relationship with your partner or with the world. It's just an amazing, um, it's something I just found absolutely fascinating. And through the process of training and becoming a parenting coach, I met the amazing Rachel Vecht and discovered this whole world of um, corporate well-being, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm also the daughter of a civil rights activist. And so allyship has been um, part of the language that I speak and the way that I live my life since before I even knew it was a thing. And so being able to share all these different topics has been amazing. Um, I'm a neurodivergent individual myself. I have ADHD and I also have four children, three of whom are neurodivergent. And so I have kind of that trifecta perspective on neurodivergence. And I have to say through all of my training, um, you know, which has been a lot, I'm a bit of a training junkie, but uh, through all of my training, the way, the way I get the best experience to be able to share is through my children and the life lessons that I've learned of being a parent and understanding the trials and tribulations and the joys and, and excitements of what it's like to be a child in the 21st century. So it's with that that I, that I move forward and, and I speak with Educating Matters quite frequently and I have a private practice as well um, because what's important to me is to be able to find a way that everybody is able to access the world for their benefits so that we have more of an even playing field. Thank you, thank you, Gwen. So I can see it's really hard to keep up with the chat. We, after the session, we are going to share um, also some useful resources and all the details about how to get in touch with Esther and find out about her book will be in there as well. So Esther, can you, um, you know, as a mother, along with your the history of, you know, sadly what happened with your sister, and it's just incredible how you were able to share that. Can you explain you know, really a little bit more to everyone about what you were trying to achieve through Sophie Says. Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it all started with a book in the middle of the night whilst writing, whilst feeding my son. Um, but in the night after Rebecca passed away, um, I've always found writing very therapeutic, um, just as Rebecca found drawing. I can't draw, so writing was kind of my, my, my only thing. Um, and I found writing these messages as if I was writing to me as a as a mum, as a parent, as a younger child, very therapeutic. We went 
straight into lockdown. I had an 18 month old. I was working full time in a very senior job at Unilever, um, trying to deal with grief that was not really grief because I couldn't see anybody and we weren't allowed to do anything. So I was trying to navigate my way through and I found writing really helped me. And the more and more I worked on it, the more and more I felt connected with Rebecca. And the more I felt this was something I needed to do to kind of build a legacy for her. But at the same time, watching my son during lockdown and watching other friends' kids during lockdown as well, I'm starting, I was starting to realize the intensity of what mental health actually meant for younger children as well and how important it is to catch it at an early stage and be proactive around it rather than reactive and talk about it in a way that I say of like, it's about feelings. You know, if we talk to primary school children, we don't mention mental health or anything like that. We just talk about feelings and understanding our feelings and understanding how to talk about our feelings and finding safe spaces to do so. And so, yes, it started with a book. It's now three books. Um, it's also activity books. We have um, free education resources that I've worked with multiple different mental health um, charities and educational psychologists all for free downloadable on our website and um, there's lesson plans for teachers there's parent toolkits and um, we've actually just launched um, a song as well for younger children uh, so they can join in with all the actions and, and basically what I'm trying to do is, is, is build a brand that really makes life's most important lessons fun to learn I think as a parent and I'm, I'm sure there's so many other parents uh, that agree with me on this the things that are out there for our children to watch and to absorb are not equipping our children with the tools that they need to get through a childhood in this century. And what I'm trying to do is change that, change that narrative. Instead of watching or reading books that don't represent society, that don't represent family constructs, that don't represent what, what our society actually is rather than what it was you know, years and years ago, I think a, a lot has changed and that we really need our <laughs> children to understand that from the age of two, they really understand a lot more than we give them credit for. And actually they can understand a lot of these messages and they can embed it in their childhood so that they can then become more resilient um, throughout their childhood and their adulthood. So you have one book, I can, I will, one book, it's okay not to be okay, one book, be proud of who you are. Okay, so you've got self-esteem, confidence, you've got um, mental health, you've got feelings. And, you know, we've had so many parents say to me, I wish I would have had this book or these books when I was younger. You know, the education system isn't doing that. So we, we kind of need to help parents and and teachers. I kind of call it the triangle, if I do it like this. So you've got your children at the top who are the epicenter of everything and you've got your parents over here and, and, and your teachers over here. And there, are, there really aren't many things out there that join up the three. And for me, that's what I am now spending every single day trying to do and hopefully will do for as long as I possibly live to try and join those dots so that, pet, that children can move forward, become more resilient and live a happier, healthier life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, I mean, since the start of, as you mentioned, that pandemic was, <laughs> Oxford University have been tracking the impact of COVID on children and young people. And according to their research, one in six are experiencing mental health difficulties compared with one in nine back in 2007. So Gwen, can you give us, I mean, people have been unbelievable about sharing lots of different challenges they're facing with their children and I hope that makes all of you I mean it's not good to hear everyone everyone's having things but like we've all got our own different um challenges but can you give us some insight into any common themes that you are seeing in your therapy practice and work supporting families I mean what kinds of things should should parents be looking out for you know that's such a great question and one of the my most favorite quotes when it comes to questions like this comes from Carl Rogers, who is one of kind of the, the fathers of humanistic psychology. And he says, what's personal is universal. So we all feel so isolated when it comes to mental, mental illness and feels very isolating when our children are struggling. But actually, the, the details of the story may be 
personal, but the themes behind it are so universal. You know, one of the main things that's come out kind of post um, post lockdown is that the primary care parent who has always had kind of an awareness of their children's ups and downs had, had a stronger awareness than the parent who's not necessarily the primary care parent in those types of um of relationships has started to be able to come on equal ground with forming this playbook for how am, how am I going to serve my children? Because when, when you have neurodivergent children, a lot of times, if you're not with them every single day, you don't quite understand the quirks, the things that work, the things that don't, the things that make it seem a little bit strange, the things that might be triggers. And usually parents aren't on the same level, but I've seen more people come in as couples wanting to form this playbook together so that they can meet the needs of their children. Um, uh, learning to live with uncertainty has been a huge theme, both with parents, with not parents, with children, that idea of, um, you know, we had this naive sense of security in our world before all of this happened. And now we all are living in this moment of, you know, is it safe to do this? Is it safe to do that? Things that we took for, is it safe to go to the grocery store? Things that we took for granted, mask, no mask, all that, you know, and all these different opinions and everything coming out. And the truth is there is no certainty when it comes to this. We just have to continue on and thrive and survive as a species. So that's been a major theme. Um, a lot of people have been reevaluating their priorities. And this has been amazing to be able to facilitate journeys for because people are starting to say, actually, you know, I spent all this time with my family and now people are wanting me to go back to work and I don't want to go back into the office full time. I'm not saying that I'm not going to work full time, but actually I enjoyed pick up and drop off. I enjoyed, you know, being able to see my kids teachers more than once a year. Um, so how can I reevaluate my career priorities, where we live, all this idea of the values I'm wanting to show my children and the, and what I'm starting to change is a value because we've had this new idea of how actually I can work from home sometimes, or I can work remotely or I can work at different times and still be as productive, if not more so. Um, on the negative side of things, general anxiety disorder is on the rise. And certainly um, it, it's on the rise in children and in adults. So, And this is like the diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder. So there are all these people too who don't get diagnosed. We have to remember that anxiety lives in the future and anxiety lives in the unknown. So hello, it's just a recipe for, I don't know what's gonna happen in the future. And so now my anxiety is increasing and we and our anxiety is increasing over little things that are happening and they're building and building and building. And one of the other things that's, that's come about that I didn't really, I, I should have seen, but I didn't see coming was this idea of when we go back to work, when we're starting to go back to work full-time in an office space, there's separation anxiety, but it's not just from child to parent. There's this reverse separation anxiety happening, happening from parent to child where it's like almost like a FOMO type thing, but it's stronger than that of I don't want to miss out on these things that I've been able to be a part of. I don't want my children to feel like I'm abandoning them. This new level of guilt, this new level of shame, and this, this very strong desire to keep the strong bonds that have been built. Not to say that we all didn't get it, have moments over, over the pandemic. We didn't all have moments of lockdown where we're just like, can I just have five minutes of not spending time with the people I love the most in the world? You know, But people really did appreciate these, this time and these bonds and this insight into their child's world that they never had before. So that separation anxiety has been a huge piece of it. But here's the thing that I, that is most important is that all of these problems and all of these situations and things that people were going to existed well before COVID, you know, but the, the difference is that we have seen this renaissance of awareness because all of these issues have had to be dealt with at, on a societal level all at once. And so what I'm hoping is that when we think about mental health for 2022, I don't want to go back to the way that it was. I don't want to go back to, you know, keep calm and carry on and suck it up and push through and all that. I want us to be able to take this learning and move forward and make real change happen, both for our children, for working parents, for stay at home parents, because while the need has not changed, the willingness to ask for it and to receive help has. So let's make sure that when people are reaching out and asking for help and support that they're able to get it. Yeah, that's such a, I mean, it's a really positive way of looking at it. I mean, one of the, if there is, there are any plus sides is people are just so much more open. 
you know, yeah. about really sharing when you say, how are you? It's not fine. How are you? You actually, you get an answer. And I desperately hope as we're, you know, slowly transitioning back to a more familiar life um, that we don't, we don't kind of go back into our old, yeah, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy and rushing around. And um, these conversations really, really do continue. Absolutely. But thank you. Thank you for sharing that insight. So um, I'm, I'm always emphasizing to parents that, that they are actually the greatest expert on their children. And you as parents, you know your children better than anyone else. Um, especially now, most of our audience are working parents, probably with very intense jobs. And because of this period, it's been that opportunity to spend more time with them. And as you alluded to, Gwen, to um, just observe more and understand more what's going on. I forgot to share the results, but um, we can see that 69% of our audience are concerned um, about their children's emotional well-being. And, you know, that 19%, 19% not sure, <laughs> I get why, you know, I feel I can't just say yes or no. Um, I need to add that not sure element. Um, but we're all about um, practical resources. So all the webinars that we deliver on any topic are really fundamentally about sharing tried and tested strategies that can actually make a difference to family life. So I really want to get practical. There have been loads of different questions coming through. I don't even know how we're going to begin to answer them all. But <laughs> before we do look at those, how as parents and caregivers, can we enable children to feel more at ease when it comes to sharing their feelings? And how can we as adults really demonstrate that we are listening and understanding? Now, for the three of us, and I'm keeping quite quiet here, but this is literally our favourite topic of conversation. So we could spend at least a day answering this question. But so I know it's really, it's really broad. But Esther, what would you say? And because you've had so much interaction with young children recently, like what are your like top strategies to really get kids to feel that they can talk? Yeah, amazing. So um, yeah, I've got got two that we can talk about and then we can go into more depth later but um, uh, the chat is amazing looking at how many people are, are speaking um, so for me uh, it's safe space this is what I talk to children about teachers and parents and, and what does that mean it, it can be anywhere but it's what the child feels as a safe space and that means it's somewhere where they have something that is close to them. So sometimes a child, and I'm talking about primary school children when, when I'm doing the work that I'm doing. So a teddy bear or a blanket that they like, it can be anywhere, it could be somewhere quiet. Um, and what it means is it's either them by themselves or sat with you. But while you're sat with them, there should be no other distractions. Because a lot of what happens is children think, okay, well, I might feel safe to try and talk about how I'm feeling, but oh, mummy or daddy's on their phone or the TV's on and suddenly they're, they're young, they're, their mind will switch. And what you need is create that safe, quiet, calm space that they feel comfortable to be able to talk. So safe space, sit with them with no distractions. And the other thing I say is you maintain eye contact. Don't expect them to maintain eye contact because they probably won't. But for the one second that they do look up to get your attention to see if you're looking, always make sure that you are there with them so that they know that they're, even if they sit in silence for an hour, whatever it is, that they know that you're there for the one second that they think, OK, I feel ready to talk. That will make it all worth it. And that's from a, a children's side. And again, like Rachel said, I could talk about this for hours, but in a, in a real short summary um, that for children, for adults, especially as parents, especially with, you know, you've got everything going on at home, work, life, balance, everything. It's, it's crazy at the moment. And trying to stay as calm as possible. And it's so easy in a second to kind of lose your temper or whatever. There's so many times I just take a step outside, take a deep breath and come back in. And you can scream into a pillow later, but you'll feel so much worse if you then do it in front of them. So however annoying they're being, and if they're being annoying, it's they're acting out because they don't necessarily know how to talk about how they're feeling. So it's getting them to understand, is that anger? Is that actually you're scared of something? Is it that you're sad? Because up until now, I think so many kids either learn happy or sad. 
and everything gets bucketed into happy or sad. And it's just, it's so not the way of life. There's so many other things that come into that. So if we can get them to understand if it's anger or if it's they're sad about something or if it's that they're scared about something, that can help navigate the conversation. So yeah, just in summary, safe space and calm is, is what I'd say. Thank you. And one of the things um, that I'm including, one of the questions is where do we get all these resources? Uh, just to repeat, we'll share them. But one one of the things I put in that follow-up is, um, you know, probably people have seen it, but Dr. Gloria Wilcox's Feelings Will, um, which goes in much deeper into, because if we don't give our children the vocabulary, like they know, they know what a pen is or a bottle, but, you know, very often at nursery, they'll say, use your words. And the problem is, how do you explain yeah. frustrated or embarrassed or fearful? Like it, you, Emotions are not like a tangible thing. So unless we talk about them and we do what Dan Siegel says, which is name it to tame it and actually begin to, to label those emotions, they're not gonna get their heads around them. And I know a lot of parents, especially because I've been talking about this all week, one of the most common questions I've had is like, isn't there a danger of making too much of a big deal of it? And if we talk about it too much, then maybe it's turning it into something bigger. But I promise you that if you just ignore and dismiss and pretend it's not happening, it's going to pop up somewhere else and even a few years later. So um, it's really, you know, it's really taking that time to 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 talk about them and help them begin to. Because really managing emotions is all about, first of all, being aware of them, being able to articulate them. And then obviously the next stage is learning how to self-regulate and, and manage them. So Gwen, what would you kind of share as your? Yeah, you know, I like to think about this, like what applies to kind of the full age range? Because there's certain things that work with the younger ones and then the older ones are like, I swear, mom, if you get that teddy bear out, I'm going to rip its arms off, right? So so how can we kind of put themes around it in a way that, that kind of helps us create a better bond with our kids? Because that's the truth. Whatever we do, it's about building that relationship, whatever trick or technique or work, you know, whatever thing we're doing, it's just about reminding our children that we are here for them, that we can help them regulate and that they're loved and supported. So I thought about this in a way of big moments and little moments. So you have the big moments, you know, kind of like Esther was talking about, they're really broke, broken down, they're feeling sad, they're having a moment. So you have that time on the couch. That's when eye contact is incredibly important. That uh, Assuming that your child doesn't have sensory needs, that means that eye contact is very uncomfortable. Um, that's when we're we're going to use our active listening skills. That's when we're going to check for understanding. Um, those big moments are also things like when we first have the talk about drugs or the first time we have the talk about sex or the first time we have the talk about bullying, where it's sitting down and almost a parent teacher moment, you know, where you're, you're needing to check to make sure that they're listening and to have that understanding. And those are highly, highly important to make sure that we're staying calm, staying flat affect, but just in a caring way and really finding out what do our children know, what gap do I need to fill in giving physical support if that's welcome or just emotional support or just sharing the space together but then we have these things that are just these little moments that we have where we're side by side in the car and some you know we're talking about something that happened at school or we're cooking dinner and so and and they're not wanting to kind of do much but but you hear you so you're picking up on something your intuition is being triggered or you're sat at the table and they're drawing and you're tell me about your drawing and, and you're realizing that what they're doing is drawing their feelings and at this point it's okay that we don't have eye contact here because it can feel very confrontational when it's not a planned moment when it's not that moment where they're asking for support. So we don't have the eye contact, but we still share the space. Um, and we we can use things like the my friend Joe technique, which is my favorite therapist technique. Like, oh, you know, my friend Joe said that his son, his, um, son is being bullied at school be because he's autistic. What do you think about that? Um, you know, and you're just kind of talking with each other and sharing a space with each other and you're broaching these subjects. You know, I don't have a friend, Joe, but they don't know that. But, you know, you're broaching these subjects so that you can start to see what are you thinking? What are you believing? Where are your values? Or I saw this on TV. I saw on TV that there is an incident and this is what it looked like. What are your thoughts on that? 
those little moments are so very important. And the more little moments we can we can have with them, the better, especially as they start to get older, because there's nothing worse than trying to talk to your teenagers and you get teenager face, you know, like, the, you know, they don't want to hear it. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to see that. But having little and often moments makes a huge impact on them. And then also just finally remember that what's important to them is important. So if your five-year-old comes in and it's so incredibly important to them that somebody is hanging their coat on, on the wrong peg, for us, it feels like as adults, it's like, well, just move it or just use a different peg. But for them, it's so very important. And when we start to let them know what's important to you is important to me, we're practicing that bond. We're practicing those moments. So as they get older and the consequences of the choices that they're needing to make can be very lasting, we already have this, this dialogue down. We already know how to connect and talk to each other. So they're more relaxed into coming to talking to their parents about it. So those are the two things. That I would yeah. think of. And I, I would say, I mean, Gwen and I definitely agree on this, that relationship and connection is, is honestly the best tool that you have. If you only focus on one thing in the next 18 years with your child, like as a mother of like two adults now and a 15 year old, and then, you know, you want that, that relationship where they feel, even if they've already messed up, which they will at some point, and even though they know you might not like what they're going to tell you, that they have that safe space to express themselves. And the way I like to describe it is almost be like being an emotional container vessel for your child. You don't have to give solutions. You don't have to, you know, analyze what they're saying. It's just that, that safe space to express themselves. And nurturing emotional intelligence in children, helping them learn how to manage and articulate their emotions I passionately believe is the most fundamental life skill. That's why I shifted my career from teaching maths and English to actually teaching parents the skills to really set their kids up for life. And I am actually really excited to share that this week, I finally launched an online parenting course. I've been to do this for so long, but what I've basically done is shared all my favorite strategies um, to raise children of any age to thrive. And there is a whole section on navigating emotions. So it's like drawing on 30 years of experience, everything I learned teaching other people's children, which is way easier than having your own, having <laughs> for myself, but also speaking to tens of thousands of parents literally around the world. So I put together this course, it's accessible anytime, anywhere, short videos and resources. And the next few days, especially during Children's Mental Health Week, there's a 50% discount on it. So we'll share some information about that. And something important to remember as parents and carers is you create that narrative and culture within your own families. Like us, all three of us, we, we do loads of work on culture in the workplace, but you're creating your own mini culture and climate at home. And your role is to help your children, I believe, understand that all feelings are normal. You can never be wrong for having an emotion or a feeling. And we're all gonna go through different cycles and waves of emotions throughout even an hour, never mind about the course of a day or a week. So let's have a look. Um, I don't even know how to begin to tackle these questions, to be honest, because there are so many brilliant ones and there is so much um, in the chat. If any of you, have either of you seen one that you really feel like you want to answer? Um, that I'll, I'll start with one which is kind of broad. Some of them are, are more specific, but it's around um, keeping our own emotions in check. And it's a bit like, um, you know, what Esther was alluding to about being triggered yourself. And how can we react better? And this parent actually said they react better when they think about things from their perspective. And there is something in our brains called mirror neurons, which means, especially with our kids, we mirror each other's emotions. And so on the one hand, you want to show your kids, you know, feelings are normal. Um, and we have days when we, you know, have, have diff it's not good and bad either. It's just like we go through different emotions. And, and parents often worry, like, how much should I share with them without, you know, making my child anxious about me? Um, but what would you say about, you know, keeping keeping your own emotions in check? I guess that always starts with what parents are terrible at, which is making sure they look after themselves first. 
that whole analogy of the oxygen mask. <laughs> but any thoughts on that? You know, I um I have a I have a million thoughts on this. And as a highly emotive person, I know what it's like to get caught in that drama cycle with your children where they they're here and you're here and you're here. And you know, you when when I'm under-resourced, it takes me a minute to check. One technique that I've given a lot of my clients to use actually is to take a breath, take a beat, and imagine yourself as a scientist in a lab coat with a clipboard and you're observing and to kind of pretend that that's the role that you're playing there. Because, um, you know, scientists don't get upset if the rat doesn't make it to the end of the maze, right? Scientists don't get upset if there's a reaction within some sort of experiment that they're doing. They're just simply watching, observing, paying attention and being data collectors. So if you can kind of step back, take a breath because you're gonna need it um, and just watch, observe, and kind of know that it is not your job to fix. It is just your job to facilitate. Kind of, it, I know it sounds goofy, but taking that moment just really helps you remember the minute I step into this drama cycle with my child, then we've lost. I'm no longer a support person. I'm a partner in the drama. So if I can step back and stay back, I can keep my flat affect, keep myself open and then move forward. Now, after it's over, that's when we go for a run, scream in the pillow, do the, you know, or, you know, we, we all have those moments where we're just like, your child walks away and you're just like, Ooh. and that's okay. But that's about me. And so I'm going to hold my stuff for me, but in front of my child, in order to make, um, make them uh, understand what's going on with them, I'm going to stay flat and kind and just leave it at that. Yeah, I think I, I totally agree. I think the only other point that I've kind of learned as well, more from just being a parent, is that we are all obviously, you know, part of our own childhood as well and what we had from our parents. So I, I know for me, my parents are incredibly strict, incredibly pressurized and never said to us that they were proud of us or loved us. They said it to everybody else. So I found that when I had my son, all I wanted to do was say to him, like, I love you. I'm proud of you just constantly, constantly. And I, I suddenly realized that's not going to do him any good either. And I had to almost take a step back and look at myself first of what is the parent that I want to be to my son rather than what's the outcome I want. So I had to kind of flip it on its head and it is difficult and you don't really have time to do it because life moves at a million miles an hour. But for me, taking that step back and thinking about that was integral to how I then manage my emotions and his emotions moving forward as well. Yeah, I mean, one, one of my favourite tools comes from Dr. Laura Markham, um, who's got this phrase, stop, drop and breathe. She's got, she, her book is Calm Parents, Happy Kids. But basically, in that moment, like we, the thing is that when our kids are experiencing a difficult emotion, either it makes us really anxious or it's like incredibly inconvenient because you're just trying to drop them at school and they're not getting in the car seat or you know, it's irritating sometimes. It's like, why do we have to have such a drama? Because I've given you an orange cup and you wanted a pink one. Um, but this, her mantra is stop, drop and breathe. So it's like, the first thing is to, I, I envisage in my head pressing a pause button on the TV remote. Like, just, just stop for one second, just pause and chase the why. What is going on under the surface? What this is the other thing is that all behavior is communication. So we always react to the behavior they're ignoring us, they're slamming doors, they're not listening, they're biting their sibling. And actually the root cause of that behavior is the emotion underneath. So just taking that moment to, someone wrote this in the chat, put yourself in your child's shoes, look at things from their perspective. And then the drop is to drop all your thoughts and feelings. So you watch your child and you're like, we, we catastrophize into the future, like Gwen said. All this stuff from the past is like, like Esther said, oh, I sound like my mother now, and I swore I'd never do that. You know, and, and like, this child is two. If they're two and they won't listen to me, what's gonna happen when they're 12? Or this child is so anxious, they're never gonna be able to like go out by themselves. And, and so they don't need all your thoughts and feelings mixed up with theirs. You've just gotta drop that. Your child in that moment is having a problem, not being a problem and breathe. Like on Sunday, I read this article in the Times about a best-selling book on breathing. And I know it sounds silly and we do it every day, all day long, hopefully, but we need to learn how to do it. And being conscious of your breath and modeling that for your children, you know, when you change the pattern of your breath, it's literally sending a signal to your parasympathetic nervous system to just 
hold that. I used to do things when my kids were young, like literally lie on the floor and shut my eyes when they're having it. I'm just, oh, I'm just pretending I'm on the beach and I'm going to just let the waves fall. You know, it's, it's what we model to them. Um, there's quite a few. Real quick, Rachel, somebody said in the chat, I wish we could pause them for a minute. But here's oh, the is when imagine they, you can well but not only that but when they watch you learning to pause they will learn to pause because you're modeling that behavior now it's going to take some time but but you we're playing a long game here right you know i once had a teacher say i'm trying to get your child to the end of this year and i'm like well i'm trying to get them to be an adult so there we have different opinions but as your child watches you i need to take a breath i need to take a pause i need to take a step then they're going, oh, so when I'm feeling highly emotive, I need to take a pause. I need to take a breath. I need to take a step. Yeah, and that's exactly it, Gwen. I think you hit the nail on the head. So everything that I see now in a kid's life is so short term. The, kid, the teachers want to get them to the end of the term. You want to get them in the car. You want to get them here. You want to get. I, I feel so strongly that our job as parents is to get them to, you know, 30, 40, you know. And so if you're going to be 10 minutes late to somewhere, that kind of thing in a way over 40 years doesn't necessarily have to be as big and that's sometimes how I look at things differently now I don't want to constantly be rushing my child I don't want to constantly be telling them you have this deadline you have this things are calmer when you think about things more long term yeah yeah we do like one of the things I mean one of the things I talk about on my course the very beginning and I always say to parents is it comes from Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey, who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families, talks about creating like a family mission statement. Like really sit down. And if your child is too young, you don't need to do it with them. But what qualities and characteristics does my child need to succeed in life? You know, everyone's got a different definition of success. But what are the most important values that I want to instill in my kids? And that is where our area of focus should should be it shouldn't be on you know getting to whatever doing reading to page seven of a book or you know doing this that and the other or it we 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 lose we're so stuck in the moment like you say Esther that we lose that bigger picture and and I kept saying um to parents when I was doing all those sessions during lockdown about how to homeschool and actually raise a child that they're going to forget most of what you say and what you do. And they're just, the main thing they're going to remember is how you made them feel. And that's kind of where the area of priority should be. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot in the chat as well about, obviously, about concerns around social interaction and friendship, because especially for young kids, they have missed so much over the last couple of years. So either kids lacking confidence feeling withdrawn um shy what do you oh someone's saying the last point there are too many good ideas in the chat to keep up with i agree rachel and what i was thinking of doing is i'm going to copy the whole chat remove all the names and i'm going to share it with everyone afterwards Great. um so <laughs> we'll try to capture that as well um so any thoughts on on kind of supporting children with with feeling confident and and that social interaction and friendship and I think it's really important to normalize that for the kids like the social and emotional well-being has to come before the learning when they go you know schools need to focus on that as well as the academics but have you guys got any thoughts on on how to help your children just feel a bit more confident and secure I, I do as well I'm sure Gwen does too happy happy to go first um Similar to kind of what I said before around these social constructs of kids, I think everyone at the moment thinks, oh, kids need to be able to go into a party full of 30 kids and go straight in and interact. And, you know, this kind of social con construct of, of what a child needs to do. I really think we need to kind of rip that apart and say, do you know what? If a child just wants to have a, a play date for younger children or, you know, be outside when they're older with one or two other friends, that's fine. Look at us as adults. We don't need hundreds of friends anymore. Why is that such a thing when they're kids that they suddenly need to be able to walk into every single social social situation and, and be on form? It's such an unrealistic expectation that, that society has of children that I, I we almost need to look at it from an adult point of view of like, you're asking them to walk into a networking event literally every second of their life, which I'm sure for most of us is the most horrible thing we have to do, that actually can we can we turn it around and 
if they want to spend time with one or two friends and learn what a quality friendship is, actually, I see that as a really positive thing. And they should know that from us and from their friends as well. It's, it's just a small point, but I really think it's it's flipping the narrative here that I think is really important. And also just thinking about that, it, it shifts so much. Like I remember one of my kids, we went to like one of these end of term assemblies and she was the only child in the class that wouldn't stand up to sing the song with the class. And that was in like reception. And by year six, I'm not saying it's the basis mom, but she had the lead part in the school play. But for the first few years of school, she was like, and, and that completely changed. But it's also kind of not labeling children in a certain way and saying, oh, you're so shy and you're this and you're that. And just letting them slowly build up that confidence. I also, I think role play is really helpful for kids. So, right, we need to do this as well because we, some of us have got um, not in the habit of socializing. But if you're standing in the playground, um, and it looks like everyone's got someone to play with. How, what can you actually say? Like, like role play on a Sunday. So I'll pretend to be a child playing with someone else. When you walk up to me, what could you actually say to start that conversation? So they've practiced being in those different scenarios or being at their cousin's birthday party where their cousin's got all their school friends and they don't know anyone. How do you kind of start conversations? Yeah, and also that, that shy is, is not a bad, you know, this labels that these kids get. It's actually yeah. looking at the child and working out who are they for themselves and how do you bring that out in a really good way that that child being shy means that actually they're more attentive to something else and pulling out those things and giving them the confidence that to be proud of who they are rather than, oh, you're so shy and automatically mm -hmm. they're kind of put to the side. Yeah, and the ones that kind of stand on the edge of a birthday party, for example, are often you know, processing, working out what's going on. It's not, there's no kind of positive and negatives to that. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, take looking at it from a neurodivergent perspective too. So I like for me, when I took the, all those personality assessments, I'm like 99% extrovert. Like I want to be at every party. I want to be at every networking event. I love it. My husband, if he could live in this little box house on his own and just do his, like he, he's the exact opposite. Doesn't like networking, just wants to get on with life. What needs very few friends. Um, and, and you can see this manifest in our children. Now the difficulty is with with children who are naturally kind of more outgoing when we're putting this expectation on them that you have to be friends with everybody they develop a condition that's called rejection dysphoria which means anytime somebody says they don't like me I take it so personally it is a judgment on my character and it really knocks my self-esteem because I want to be out there I want to be the life of the party and yet this person doesn't like me why don't they like me and what's wrong with me what's wrong with me what's wrong with me and then the child who doesn't want to go out there then they have the opposite where it's like what's wrong with me why don't I want to go out there why don't I have 800 friends like my mom seems to think I have you know some of these expectations actually come from some sort of childhood rejection that we went through as parents that we never want our children to experience because there's nothing worse than those moments in life when you feel like somebody's hurt your feelings but we don't need to protect our kids from that. We don't need to protect them from somebody not liking them unless they're being abused. We need to help them process through those moments. So as adults, they're able to process those times when they don't win or they're not the best or they're, or somebody just doesn't get on with them for no other reason than their personalities don't, don't clash. Rather than trying to stop these moments of, oh no, you have to like everybody and everyone has to like you. I'd much rather teach my children when they're young how to cope with the fact that not everybody's going to. Yeah, so there's true. a really strong theme coming through that I've also, I'm really <laughs> struggling to read everything and pick it all together, but um, about being afraid of getting something wrong. So a lot of people are talking about their kids being perfectionists um, or not wanting to try anything new. And this whole piece around um, building up children's resilience. I mean, I know that one of my favorite tools, um, aside from the kind of reflective listening, and emotion coaching and it goes back to this first one of the first books I read on parenting 27 years ago when I was really struggling with a child in my class is also how to talk in a way that kids will listen because most of what we say um, to our children is either giving them an instruction or telling them what they've done wrong and then when parents say why does my child never listen to me which is probably the most popular question frankly what you're saying is not very interesting and they heard it an hour ago and yesterday and last week and you know 
So I think that it's very important when you're talking about building up resilience um, and confidence and self-esteem is, is when you speak to your kids to just catch every tiny step in the right direction. So there's a phrase called descriptive praise when you just describe what it is you see your child doing. So if for once, you know, they are quite brave about going to have a go at asking for something in a shop, um, or you notice that they're really thoughtful to their younger sibling who's just dropped her ice cream on the floor. Like it's not, it's not evaluative praise. It's not saying you're amazing, you're brilliant, you're so good, but it's just noticing those little characteristics and steps in the right direction. And also very much nurturing that growth mindset. So when children say, I can't do this, um, and in the blog section, by the way, on our website, there is different categories. I remember you've written a whole series about growth mindset, Gwen, but it's this idea of, I can't do this yet. You know, yet is only a three letter word, but it's really, really powerful. And, and knowing that you don't go, and, and sharing stories um, of people, that's why, you know, watching like the Paralympics or Emma, the 18 year old who suddenly, you know, is unbelievable. It's, well, not suddenly, she worked at it for years, but they think that all these politicians, and they probably don't care about politicians, but, you know, sports personalities or celebrities, they just arrive knowing that the journey to get there and kind of sharing that with them. But anything around, kind of managing these perfectionist tendencies or not wanting to try for fear of getting things wrong. Oh, perfection is the enemy of completion. <laughs> you know, it's that it's, I, you know, there's so many times when our kids are doing a writing thing, we say, how can you improve that? How can you do better? What else could you do? And sometimes they're like, can I, can it just be this? Can you just accept that I've written this story and I'm, I don't want to improve it. I'm good. You know, I think it's, it's not needing to pick up on every single little mistake that they make. Um, especially with homework. I mean, this is the thing is children really struggle doing homework with their parents because parents seem to think if they're doing homework, it has to be 100% correct. They're not 100% correct in school. They're not even 100% finished with a lot of their activities in schools. So rather than focusing on how can I make everything better, taking a moment and, and having kind of a mindful moment with your children and saying, let's look how great this is. Let's look how good this is. Let's look, why do you feel proud of what you've done? Why do you feel this was a good choice? Why did you make that choice that the character should do this in your short story? That's really interesting. And let them talk about their process, encourage them about the process that they've taken and really talk about the effort and the work that they're putting into things rather than worrying about is every single word spelled correctly? Is every, you know, that's not the point for homework. That's that they get enough of that at school. At home, it's about, well, I can see that you're valuing um, the fact that you need an education because you're trying and you're doing your homework. And I love that you're doing your homework because it lets me see that, um, you know, it's important to continue your learning even when you're not at school. Yeah, it's the whole hundred percent. It's the whole process rather than fixing. Right. As parents, sometimes we think, well, I need to fix this. I need to fix it. You need to get 100 percent because if you don't get 100 percent then you're going to fail. And this, 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 this. Actually, it's that process of them learning that will help them more in life than anything else. Absolutely. Totally. So um, another another good point that a few people have raised is how and again, each of these each of these questions is like a whole, a whole hour. But how do you begin to kind of spot any um, depressive or anxiety tendencies in your children, especially, I mean, someone particularly mentioned like preschoolers, like it's kind of that question of when do you, when do you really need to be worried and concerned as a parent and kind of think, actually, I need to get more support. And there's loads in the chat about how challenging it is to get that support and get in touch with CAMS, but any, any thoughts on that? So if you look at the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is what psychologists will use to, to see if there's a, an actual condition, um, there are ways that we can look. Now, we have to remember that it is a normal part of childhood development to have ups and downs, to have days where, oh, I just want to die, uh, you know, and they'll say these things using hyperbolic speech just to try and prove a point that they feel kind of miserable today. But there's something that I like to call the big six, which are these areas that you look at and say, has there been a significant change in this 
over some time in the in the manual for adults it says four weeks i would probably cut it in half for smaller children but look at how are they eating how are they sleeping how are they uh with their relationships how is their focus oh my gosh i'm gonna forget the last two eating sleeping ah rachel it's, it's jumped out of my head i'll make sure that we put it so eating sleeping uh relationships focus concentration and um, hygiene is the other one. Um, for little ones, hygiene isn't that big of a deal because you know they'll go eight years without a bath if you let them sometimes just normally. But we look at, is there a significant change over time? Two weeks feels like an eternity and four weeks really feels like an eternity when we're watching our children suffer, but you do need to give it time to say, is this just a typical thing of development? Is my daughter just about to start her first period? And actually this is a hormonal thing. Is my son just having a surge of testosterone? testosterone or is there a significant decline in their functioning and we're not looking for better or or worse we're just looking for a change so my child used to be a picky eater and now they're just self-soothing themselves with food or my child used to eat pretty well and now they they have a sore tummy and they don't want to eat all the time look for a significant change and when you see that then you know it's time for professional intervention so i'm conscious i really want to um respect people's time just to reiterate, you can share, we're going to share the recording and you are free to share that with your colleagues, your parent networks, your friends, your partners, anyone else that you think would benefit. Um, we will send this resource pack with, with further ideas. Don't want to overwhelm people, so we've just plucked a few. And, um, you know, not wanting to plug thing where I am because this parenting course really does give you the tools to address so many of the different um, challenges that you're talking about. It's really like common sense, very practical strategies that you can put in place with your kids because that needs to be the focus. We want to ultimately raise children to thrive, to really try to get the best um, out of our kids. And, um, you know, we've had such great interaction um, and such a good response. Thanks for all this lovely feedback. I think Maybe around May when we have mental health week for adults, we've got to do a round two because we could just carry on going. <laughs> going. Yeah. Esther, have you got any last any last thoughts or comments that you're absolutely desperate to say? I, I could talk for hours on this, I think. Um, yes, yeah, to respect people's time and we'll do something of a follow-up because everyone's saying we need more. And I, I think it's it's been a fantastic session. Um, thank you all for, for listening and engaging so much. It's been wonderful. Yeah, and thank you, Gwen and Esther, for uh, giving us your time. Thank you. I'm Rachel. going to and just because I know they won't. I highly encourage you to get Esther's books. I highly encourage you to take Rachel's parenting course. I've put my own husband on it. It's fantastic. I, I these are things that you that are amazing resources that will help you build a relationship with your child that will last a lifetime, which is the strongest tool that they can possibly have. So that is my final word. Yeah, and I also hope that everyone's realized from this that like. It sounds cheesy, but you really are not alone. Like so many different people have different challenges. Just, just talk about them. And by the way, um, we we provide one-to-one -one support. So if you're really, really concerned, I mean, Gwen is phenomenal, especially on anything around the neurodiversity piece. Um, if you're not getting the answers you wanted from school, if you've sought help from a psychologist and you feel like, like always reach out. Sometimes people like nine years later will say oh can you help with this I don't know I helped yesterday some mother in Nairobi I have no idea how she found me but you know we we, we and if we can't help we've got this amazing network of of people